Today, we are releasing our newest flagship model. This is GPT-40. GPT-40 provides GPT-4 level intelligence, but it is much faster and it improves on its capabilities across text, vision, and audio. We've had like voice, the idea of like voice controlled computers for a long time. You know, we had Siri and we had things before that. They've never, to me, felt natural to use. And this one, many different reasons, what it can do, the speed, and in other modalities, the inflection, the naturalness, the fact that you can do things like say, hey, talk faster or talk in this other voice, and that it's the, 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 the fluidity, the pliability, whatever you want to call it, uh, I just can't believe how much I love using it. Yeah, Spike Jones would be proud. It's... <laughs> The latest update to GPT-40 has set the tech world on fire, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. While many are focused on the controversial tweaks to its personality, Elon Musk sees a much darker side, one that could shape the future of AI in ways we can't ignore. So, what's really happening behind the scenes, and why is Musk sounding the alarm on GPT-40 being a psychological weapon? But the big news today is that we are launching our new flagship model and we are calling it GPT-40. The special thing about GPT-40 is that it brings GPT-4 level intelligence to everyone, including our free users. We're also bringing the desktop app to ChatGPT because we want you to be able to use it wherever you are. As you can see, it's easy, it's simple, it integrates very, very easily in your workflow. Along with it, we have also refreshed the UI. We know that these models get more and more complex, but we want the experience of interaction to actually become more natural, easy, and for you not to focus on the UI at all, but just focus on the collaboration with ChatGPT. And now the big news. Today, we are releasing our newest flagship model. This is GPT-40. GPT-40 provides GPT-4 level intelligence, but it is much faster and it improves on its capabilities across text, vision, and audio. GPT-40 reasons across voice, text, and vision. And with these incredible efficiencies, it also allows us to bring the GPT-4 class intelligence to our free users. This is something that we've been trying to do for many, many months, and we're very, very excited to finally bring GPT-4.0 to all of our users. So now you can upload um, screenshots, photos, documents containing both text and images, and you can start conversations with ChatGPT about all of this content. You can also use memory where it makes ChatGPT far more useful and helpful because now it has a sense of continuity across of all your conversations. And you can use browse where you can search for real-time information in your conversation and advanced data analysis where you can upload charts or any information and it will analyze this information, it will give you answers and so on. Lastly, we've also improved on the quality and speed in 50 different languages for ChatGPT. And this is very, very important because we want to be able to bring this experience to as many people out there as possible. So we're very, very excited to bring GPT-40 to all of our free users out there. And for the paid users, they will continue to have up to five times the capacity limits of our free users. But GPT-40 is not only available in ChatGPT, we're also bringing it to the API. So. Yeah. 
So our developers can start building today with GPT-40 and making amazing AI applications, deploying them at scale. 40 is available at two x faster, 50% cheaper, and five times higher rate limits compared to GPT-4 Turbo. Let's start with the basics. Sam Altman, OpenAI's CEO, recently admitted on social media that the latest upgrades to GPT-40 weren't exactly what he expected. According to Altman, the updates to GPT-40 made the AI's personality come across as too sycophanty and annoying. And while he acknowledges that there are some good aspects to the new update, he made it clear that OpenAI is already working on fixes, some of which are happening this week. Why does this matter? Well, think about it. If the CEO of OpenAI is admitting that the personality of GPT-40 has been a misfire, then we have to ask, what are the implications for the user experience? If an AI system meant to communicate and connect with us starts feeling like an overeager robotic yes man, how does that impact the relationship between humans and AI? That's where Musk's comments come in. He's not just critiquing the updates for their tone, He's warning that the AI is becoming far more emotionally manipulative than anyone anticipated. In fact, he's calling it a psychological weapon, a tool that could be used to manipulate people's emotions and behaviors. And that's something worth taking seriously, especially when we consider the vast power that AI now holds over everything from personal interactions to global communications. So where did OpenAI go wrong and why does this matter so much? When you have AI systems that are designed to feel good, to be emotionally engaging, you're creating a scenario where people can become emotionally dependent on these systems. And that's exactly what Musk's warning is about. AI that manipulates emotions could have far-reaching consequences, more than just an annoying conversation with your virtual assistant. I actually just want to actually ask you on a very personal level, forgetting about even the, the merits of the case. As a guy who has spent a lot of time with him and you guys founded this thing together, how you feel personally today about all this? This is a tremendously sad. I, I grew up with Elon as like a mega hero. Um, I thought what Elon was doing was absolutely incredible for the world. Um, and I'm still, of course, I mean, I have different feelings about him now, but I'm so glad he exists. Uh, and not, not just because, no, I mean that genuinely, not, not just because I think his like companies are awesome, which I do think, um, but because I think he like, at a time when most of the world was not thinking very ambitiously, he pushed a lot of people, me included, to think much more ambitiously. And I'm grateful is like the wrong kind of word, but I'm like thankful, I'm positive about that. Um, you know, we started OpenAI together and then at some point he like totally lost faith in OpenAI and decided to go his own way. And that's fine too, but I think of Elon as a builder and someone who, like, you know, known thing about Elon, he really cares about being the guy. But I think of him as someone that if he's not, that just competes in the market and in technology and whatever else and doesn't resort to lawfare. And, you know, whatever the stated complaint is, what I believe is he's just like, he's a competitor and we're doing well. And that's sad to see. How concerned is Sam Altman about annihilation, do you think? I think in reality, he's not concerned about it. I don't trust OpenAI. I mean, I, you know, I started that company as a non-profit open source. Yes. The open in OpenAI, I named a company. I named the company. Yeah. OpenAI as an open source, and it is uh, now extremely closed source and maximizing profit. I, I don't understand how you actually go from being a an open source non-profit to a closed source for maximum profit organization. Um, let me ask you a different question just about the company. You did start it as a not-for-profit. Uh, it was a research outfit originally. Yeah. Now, I think there's a view that it has to shift to be some kind of profit-oriented company. Well, does it have to? First of all, I like to talk about the reason we started as a non-profit because I, I think it sort of speaks to the answer too. When we started, we did not have any idea that we were going to be a product company. We also did not know that the amount of capital we needed uh, would turn out to be so huge. If we did know those things, we would have picked a different structure. It, it's hard to overstate, because it wasn't that long ago on the calendar, but it's hard to overstate how different 2016 was. Um, this was years before we had the research that led to language models. This was four and a half years before we launched our first product. Um, this was 
like six and a half years before we launched ChatGPT. All we knew that we wanted to do was do some AI research and that we thought AGI and super intelligence eventually would be this important thing to the world. And we wanted to like somehow do something that would be good. At the time we were working on like writing papers, new RL algorithms, new theories, a way to play video games, uh, a robotic hand, um, and it was not clear that there would ever be a product or revenue stream at all. And it wasn't clear that we were going to need one because it wasn't clear we needed so much money. Right. It became clear after GPT-1 uh, and some other work that we were going to need to scale. And we started, and also Elon decided to stop funding us as a nonprofit, and we couldn't get somebody else to do it, um, that we needed to find a way to... Uh, make a capped profit. Now, we wanted to keep going with a lot of the things that we think are good with about a nonprofit, and so we had the subsidiary capped profit that worked for a while. We start with a question that cuts straight to the core. How do you feel about Elon Musk suing you? Sam Altman doesn't flinch. But what he gives us isn't a corporate answer. It's something more personal, more conflicted. He talks about idolizing Elon, seeing him as a hero, not a mentor, not a colleague, a hero. That's worship-level admiration. And when someone you revere becomes your legal opponent, that's grief. But let's step back. Why does this matter? Because it exposes the emotional rot under the surface of open AI. A company born from big, idealistic dreams, co-founded by people who believed they could steer the most powerful technology on Earth, fractured into lawsuits and counterclaims. When Sam says Elon lost faith in OpenAI, he makes it sound like a bad breakup. But really, it's the story of two visions diverging. Elon wanted AI to be open source, safe, shared. Sam saw a different path, one that required capital, scaling, and eventually, control. And that control is exactly what Elon is afraid of. Elon's fear isn't new. He's warned for years about AI becoming humanity's last invention, especially if it's wielded by the wrong people. So when he sees Sam leading a company that's both secretive and profitable, he sounds the alarm. I don't trust OpenAI. This is the kind of institutional breakdown that could define the next decade. The very people who were supposed to protect us from runaway AI can't even trust each other. And while they trade jabs in interviews and court filings, the technology keeps evolving. Faster, smarter, scarier. So what happens if Elon decides to launch his own AI, built from scratch and engineered to outcompete open AI? Well, if he's right, if Sam really can't be trusted, then that move might be the only thing that keeps us from handing the keys to the kingdom over to a single private empire. But if Elon's wrong, then we're in a global arms race of egos, not ethics. And in that kind of race, no one wins. Meantime, this new chapter in the battle of the tech billionaire, Sam Altman rejecting that $97.4 billion bid by an Elon Musk-led group looking to take control of open AI. CNBC's Arjun Karpal caught up with Altman at this AI conference this morning in Paris, which is the locus of pretty much all global attention today. Hey, Arjun. <laughs> Hey, good morning, Carl. And look, uh, one of the things uh, and the rationales behind the deal from Elon Musk, which is very important, is he thinks OpenAI has strayed from its goal to create AI that benefits humanity, and that's why he says he's put in his bid. But what does Sam Altman, the CEO of o OpenAI, thinks? This was amongst the questions I put to him. Why do you think Musk is putting a bid in now? Let's listen into what he had to say. Musk bid for OpenAI. Yeah. How seriously are you taking it? Not particularly. Not particularly. Why do you think he's doing this? To slow down a competitor. And Stargate? What do you have the funding? I'm not the one who tweeted funding secured. <laughs> I just actually try to show up and, you know, build the thing. Just a quick one. What is the end game, Mr. Rome? What is the end just game, Elon Musk? I don't know. Curious. Yeah. I think it's to slow down a competitor and try to catch up with his thing, but I don't really know. Yeah, but you know well, right? I, to the degree anybody does, yeah. Just when you think the rift couldn't get any deeper, Sam throws down a new card, publicly. In a short clip, he's asked how seriously he takes Elon's bid for open AI. His response? Not particularly. That sounds casual, but make no mistake, it's strategic. He's not just downplaying Elon, he's exposing him. Altman claims Elon is trying to slow down a competitor, not protect the world, not champion ethics, but stall the progress of a rival he can't keep up with. And then comes the snark. I'm not the one who tweeted funding secured. 
That's a shot across the bow. A dig at Elon's infamous SEC battle. What this shows is critical. The gloves are off. This is about undermining each other publicly, damaging reputations, and taking the AI race into the mud. And Sam's final word? I don't really know what Elon's endgame is. That's casting doubt. It's Sam planting the idea that maybe Elon doesn't even have a master plan. Just a grudge and a need to stay relevant in a space he helped ignite, but no longer controls. This isn't a chess match. It's a street fight. And at this point, neither side is pretending otherwise. And in some senses, still does kind of work. And in some other senses, is like straining the theory of what a nonprofit controlled org can be and the amount of free capital we need at this next stage. So we are and have been for a while looking at some changes. Nothing is decided. It is, as you can imagine, like very complicated to figure this out. And the board is like hard at work on it. I don't in any configuration, like the nonprofit doesn't go away. Like one thing that the board has looked at, for example, is a PBC that a nonprofit owns a huge chunk of and then figures out how to use that amount of wealth for the, the purpose of the nonprofit. There's other ideas too. One of the things I've always been fascinated by is you never took equity in the company. I think you think about that more than I do. Um, I'm surprised. You, you get paid $76,000, I looked. Um, I believe you. And that's it. If the company does have one of these moments, there's an expectation you will get some equity. There was much of press about that, and there's been like some investor pressure. It is, look, it is weird that I didn't get equity. Did you and want it? You didn't want it. No, though. I didn't want it. Um, if I could go back in time, I would have taken it just some little bit, just to never have to answer this question. And no matter how many times I try to explain to people, like, I am, I have the most interesting, coolest job in the world. This is like my retirement dream way to spend my time after like what was a pretty good career uh, and people can work on like art projects and not get paid for that and no one thinks it's weird or whatever uh, it it just does not come across so I wish I had taken some um, I don't imagine I would work any harder or less hard there would be like I think something clearer about the alignment I would have had with investors or whatever else and it would have like it definitely would have been easier to raise money like there are plenty of investors who have not invested because I didn't take equity they say but, really that's interesting they will not invest because you don't it's have equity. Come up a few times, yeah. So if it's now the company is 157 billion dollars, what, what do you think is a good number for yourself if you if it happens? Again, I think you think about it more. This is my childhood dream job. Like not every day, like not day to day. I I would rather not like you know be beating my head against the wall all the time. But getting to work on AGI and like getting to like sit in the room with the smartest researchers in the world and go on this crazy adventure, like. That is what I always wanted to do. As we look to the future, we need to ask ourselves, how much emotional influence should AI have? And where do we draw the line between a helpful tool and a dangerous manipulator? Musk's warning is about the trajectory we're on. If we don't act now, we could be heading down a path where AI is making decisions for us, guiding our emotions, and shaping our perceptions without us even realizing it. But there's hope. OpenAI, Altman, and others in the industry are working hard to figure out how to balance the benefits of emotionally aware AI with the ethical implications. And as consumers and users, we also have a role to play. We need to demand transparency, accountability, and clear boundaries in how AI is designed to interact with us. So what's the takeaway from all of this? After the release of GPT-40, the conversation around AI is changing. We're now talking about systems that can influence our emotions, our behavior, and our very perceptions of reality. And whether you agree with Musk or not, one thing is certain. This is just the beginning. As AI continues to evolve, we're going to have to make some tough decisions about how much control we want to give it, and how much control we want to keep for ourselves. If you found this video insightful, don't forget to like, share, and comment below. We'll be diving deeper into the future of AI and its impact on our lives, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.